chapter six of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma frances brooke chapter six that same summer a cab bearing honora and her boxes drew up before a dull-looking building in a london street honora had been appointed head assistant mistress to a small metropolitan high school and in the absence of the head mistress through illness it would be her duty to organize the work of the school honora winced when she beheld her future abode and descended from the cab with a pale face the door was opened by a brisk-looking maid who accosted the new arrival with the cheerful friendliness of a cockney servant honora slew her with a glance and when her boxes were heaped in the hall and the cabin had departed freezingly requested to be shown the way to the headmistress's rooms the two rooms reserved for the new mistress were not unpleasant apartments but they were small and there was nothing of what honora called scope in them the green drawing-room at least had been spacious but in the high school all the space had apparently been allotted to the innumerable insignificants who were called the students and she was tucked in anywhere afternoon tea was brought by the familiar handmaiden in cheap white ware that reminded honora of the midland railway and desolation deepened in her mind as she sat down to drink it then a further incident occurred which seemed broadly to illustrate her probable future hardly had she sipped the last drop of conju at one shilling and tenpence per pound than the door of the sitting-room burst open and the head of a keen-faced breathless-looking girl was thrust in the hat of this energetic stranger was dowdy her face plain and her hair tousled honora awaited an explanation with stony mien the girl did not appear to recognize that one was required miss kemble i believe she exclaimed may i ask if the hour for the first mathematical will be changed this honora afterwards discovered was the teacher of mathematics margaret henderson by name she was a cockney born had been educated at university college and belonged in rank to the lower middle class in mathematics she had taken a good london degree and had a genius for imparting her knowledge when the energetic business conversation was concluded and she had gone honora pressed her hand first to her ear and then to her heart how am i to endure these persons she exclaimed a week's experience increased her loathing of the position she had to receive admonition and advice from a philistinic assemblage who were called the committee and who did not own a degree between them also she had to listen to the detailed anxieties of fussy middle-class parents who mostly used the cockney vowels and each one of whom had a separate fad about the instruction of her own particular lamb in the fold now to honora's eye all the lambs were so many heads of sheep but the new mistress had a glorious capacity for work and her university training had given her the instinct of thoroughness and finish in what she undertook the one thing honora would not do as long as health and strength were left her was to sit down and accept defeat in any situation whatever she owed it to her various grudges with life to succeed to turn even this sordid experience into an evidence of her mastery over circumstance and to keep these baying dogs of depressing misery at a distance from her something victorious and striking she must achieve even here before the first half term had expired she discovered that she had succeeded in her aim the headmistress died and the committee so far signified their satisfaction 
with honora as to appoint her to the vacant place to herself however no weeks of her life had ever seemed so barren and fruitless in spite of her quick rise she felt herself to be the victim of necessity and injustice and though occupied from morning to night she hated the processes of her work or told herself that she did so and was indifferent to the results there was another thing which the experience of half a term made only too plain to honora the teachers at the high school did not offer her any of that agreeable incense to which she had been accustomed at girton they were all engrossed in their work and in their children and as soon as school hours were over they departed to their various homes in twos or threes their friendships and outside careers seemed to have been settled once for all before her arrival and to be carried on now without an attempt to include her in them it was in the middle of the first term of her experience as a mistress that honora kemble first learned the meaning of loneliness i am completely isolated said she one day to herself with a strange new pang and then she tried to say to herself that this was only evidence of her superiority to the commonplace surroundings at the moment the day's work being done she stood at the window watching the departure of the last teacher this was a girl of about twenty-three years old who had just left the house no sooner had she disappeared than honora sat down and thought about her loneliness had already made her acquainted with those spiritual companions who torment us with discipline the name of the girl was lucilla dennison she taught english economics history and so on she had taken a moral science degree and honora despised moral science she would not for the world have acknowledged that lucilla piqued and interested her there was nothing in the english teacher as the headmistress told herself over and over again to keep the mind on edge with expectation she had a slight figure and was of dark but not brunette colouring with cloudy dark hair grey eyes and a not too liberal tint in a rather spare thin cheek she appeared to possess a great force of work honora thought the teachers grovelled in work and had no aspiration and she spoke little that little being usually uttered in a soft quiet voice which honora's clear metallic tones could easily have overborne but there was something in her beyond quietude and silent energy there were moments when the girl's eyes disturbed honora with vague suggestions at others she thought she detected in them a faint light of sarcasm in short honora's estimate of lucilla's character was unwillingly a high one and yet this same lucilla appeared to have a particular friendliness for margaret henderson whose cockney accent and cheery good fellowship of manner prevented honora from seeing anything in her save a sum of vulgarities one day a flood of light was thrown upon the estimate this world for which she had exchanged the academic elegance of girton held her in the occasion was some involuntary eavesdropping on her part she found herself on one side of a door that was ajar and which she believed separated her from an empty room but from the other side came voices and the first words she caught arrested her the proverb tells us that listeners never hear any good of themselves and they were indeed stinging sentences that crept straight to honora's ear through that distressful aperture you see you never can reckon on anything really sensible from miss kemble that was margaret henderson's voice leave her out of the reckoning then subtract her as a piece of absurdity from the sum of general conditions and have done with her it was lucilla dennison's dry quiet tone which pointed this ruthless brutality honora on hearing voices would at first have withdrawn but upon discovering that she herself was in question and that lucilla was one of the speakers she deliberately remained 
no one's interest save her own was betrayed by her doing so and only till this moment had she realized how she ached to know the estimate in which lucilla held her and to learn the causes that were driving her into isolation this isolation though flattering to her pride on one reading was always open to another less comforting interpretation i could do that replied miss henderson if my own interest only were in question but flora you see has distinctly deteriorated during this term honora believed that one of the heads of sheep was referred to you observe continued miss henderson in the particularly broad cockney by which she signalized emotion how very little originality miss kemble is putting into her estimate of the scope of the work she hangs by routine in a way that is simply paralyzing the school will die under it the younger children are already flagging flory particularly she misses miss forbes miss forbes was unwearying in her personal influence over the children and in the variety of her resources miss forbes was honora recalled the late headmistress oh yes of course that is the exasperating the serious part of the matter if it were not for the loss to the children and to the school i should find miss kemble rather an interesting study of the grotesque the elder girls are better off returned miss henderson they don't need the same kind of personal attention or care not so much at least but even there miss henderson left an expressive blank honora felt though she could not see the shrug of the shoulders that supplied it i am afraid assented lucilla that it is rather hopeless work all round the long and the short of it is continued miss henderson briskly and with a quite desperate access of cockney that we have a stick of sealing wax at the head of affairs instead of a comfortable woman and you and i between us cannot keep the school up to its former mark no not with the best will said lucilla considering the amount of routine work we have to get through i never saw anything she added slowly and deliberately honora stood with suspended breath waiting on lucilla's merciless tones quite so silly and so inadequate as miss kemble honora turned away and fled with silent winged feet to take refuge in her own room the conversation was privileged of course but every word was a corroding shaft in that most sensitive part which we good-naturedly name our vanity as of a thing small and of no account but which is to the majority really the heart's core of us she sat down covering her face with her hands because of the blood that flamed and burnt in her cheeks and the bitterness of the tears in her eyes meanwhile lucilla and margaret went home lucilla's residence was in a big model dwelling-house here she had taken a small flat and lived alone doing the little household work herself and valuing the lonely evenings for their opportunity of study the rooms were scrupulously neat and so plainly furnished that one could hardly apply the word furniture with its middle-class suggestion of heavy expenditure and horrible worry to the necessary appliances for daily life prettily decorated by her own hands which made up the list of her belongings lucilla was gifted with the sense of orderliness of womanly instinct in the details of life she now moved about deftly preparing her evening meal and that being over and the traces of it cleared away she lit her lamp and sat down first to rest and then to work to rest with lucilla was to dream she sat quite still the light from the lamp falling on some of the ruffled hairs of her cloudy locks and leaving her face with its small and rather grave features in shadow the dreams of lucilla were not the ordinary day-dreams she was not dreaming of a house a husband and her own devotion to them it may be that a new age has left the uniform features of that old dream somewhat disturbed lucilla never had pictured herself as the domestic companion of an unbroken and impossible happiness in all her dreaming she went forward 
with a restless circle of fellow-workers and wage warfare against a shameless world very probably her own personality was rather severely and coldly outlined to her imagination and her personal expectation meagre but her rejection of the commonplace idea of happiness and the conventional idea of self-immolation had a deeper root in her grey eyes was a hint of storm and revolt tinctured a good deal of her thinking for she had not in the least an acquiescent spirit but questioned everything and took little for granted it was this which gave the quality to her eyes which honora had noticed a quality not always agreeable but if she had a rather strong critical faculty she possessed at the centre of her being a white heat of capacity for self-devotion a fire-spot of passion in her heart this force of emotional capacity was however usually restrained she did not exhibit it in her ordinary bearing a sense of measure of the orderliness to which reference has already been made was intimately interfused through every habit of her life the hour being over she changed her seat for one uncompromisingly stiff and drew up to the table and her books the glare of the lamp revealed all that was spare and severe in her features the short shrift of her habit with hypocrisies and shams and also a very rare quality of intellectuality in the brow it also threw flickering shadows on the walls and ceiling and made the one luxurious corner of the room glad with bright beams that was the corner of the books in their gilt and coloured bindings hardly twenty minutes had passed when a step was heard mounting the stair lucilla looked up her pen suspended in her hand and listened the step was a tolerably solid one but it was too irregular for a man's for a perceptible second a colour and light as of wild expectation had flashed into her face it died out again at the first volatile feminine trip of the advancing feet they paused at her door and a knock came lucilla opening found honora kemble standing outside honora had changed from the brilliant figure who had startled the rector into a latin compliment a hard day's work left her sometimes indifferent to details in her dress and hair and at this moment she was breathless with running after lucilla besides which her face had the first timid doubtful look that had ever changed it lucilla upon seeing her had been unable to control the faint flash of sarcasm in her eyes and even an involuntary contraction of the lips in a whimsical grimace whereat all the superior person in honora gave way within her and the pent-up misery of weeks found natural vent she shrank back and two tears very unpremeditated and sudden rolled down her cheeks lucilla closed the door and looking paler than usual drew the head mistress to a chair what is it said she i heard every word that you said of me in the class-room returned honora with desperate honesty lucilla coloured but made no attempt to apologise honora thought however that the grey eyes had a less judicial look and did not hold her at a distance on points of sarcasm evidently in your opinion i have not been doing my duty she continued scrupulously returned lucilla the dry tone of the praise was worse than a rebuke of what then do you accuse me i have not accused you one always commends perfect behaviour returned lucilla the pressure of life was being applied rather heavily to the unfortunate honora for the time being but it was easier to accept the screw from a stranger and from one of her own sex than it had been to take it in her own home from leslie i entreat you to be open with me as open to me as you were to miss henderson in the class-room said she with an earnest and notable effort lucilla put her hand to her cheek with a shy air scarcely anything is so useless as perfect behaviour she said 
do help me murmured honora now on the tiptoe for a moral discovery i have been so very lonely lately ah the exclamation was soft and revealed quite a new side to lucilla's character but if i help you it will be with truth oh of course returned honora drearily and with disturbing memories of mr leslie littleton i neither expect nor wish for anything else you see what humanity wants is humanness however faulty am i not human on stilts indeed you are mistaken or perhaps it is because i dislike my work indeed you are mistaken there i never saw anybody who enjoyed the work so much honora heard with surprise but with conviction she did like the work what you hate is our common element you try to separate yourself from it by being superior and in that way of course you lose your chances honora inwardly felt there was justification for the assumption on her mother's side she was entitled to a notice in the collateral branches of the peerage and her father's father was enrolled amongst the landed gentry but she said nothing there are vulgarities to which we give proud hospitality in our heart of hearts and would not for the world thrust out in the nakedness of speech and of course the common element resents fastidious treatment i do not think i have intended anything of the kind said honora cautiously but i have felt lonely because you will not sit in the common boat what you yearn for is distinction difference your kind retaliates by leaving you out of the calculation perhaps you do not understand said honora timidly and still uncertain of the quality of mind to which her words were uttered that i had not expected to have to work not in this way not for my living the rather disdainful and severe little profile of lucilla did not melt at this confidence oh said she is that your trouble honora looked rather than spoke her inquiry you go about as though you were under a cloud you know do i margaret henderson has made all the excuses for you she could because she was convinced you were in trouble honora started colouring angrily to be excused by margaret henderson was indeed bitter and because of her surmise she has been doing a portion of your work during the whole of this term margaret is an exceedingly warm-hearted girl oh said honora dizzily it will not do to speak to her about it as she has rather a sensitive delicate nature and hates to be found out in her good works am i the recipient of good works but i should put it right if i were you she has been taking up a duty that really belongs to you and she is already overburdened with her own it shall be put right agonized pride smarted in honora's eyes and cheeks and if i were you i would not lose florrie what is it worth to the world if a man save his own soul and lose his neighbours it shall be put right reiterated honora with scarlet cheeks as to your misfortune we all share that and most of us call it our pride and our privilege to work yes give a thing a different name and it alters its complexion shakespeare was wrong when he said that about the rose i believe i like the work said honora now convinced through the mere process of expression that this was the case but it is not the career i would have chosen that experience is as common as death perhaps it is for my part i deliberately choose the common experience do you mean you do not aspire a smile lightened the whole of lucilla's face i have my aspirations she said i have been very ambitious said honora with scant comprehension anybody can run up into a long weed retorted lucilla oh what do you mean that your ambition is trashy honora accepted the criticism in silence she had the kind of noble pride which can take an adverse judgment without argument lucilla knew nothing about her of course but there was 
an unhesitating decision in her verdict which indicated keen insight moreover under the storms and stress of the last months the wholesale crowding of experience into a small space the memory of the greek myth project ran already like the tinkle of a dying brook under lucilla's words it ceased tell me about your ambition said she there was unconscious flattery in the stress on the pronoun but it sprang from genuine feeling honora loved the girl lucilla hesitated all her face deepened and at the moment there was a slight unconscious deviation of the steady grey eyes towards a particular spot in the room honora followed the glance which had been as involuntary as the movement of a needle to the magnet her eyes alighted with lucilla's on the portrait of a man there is always a man in the case thought she discontentedly lucilla seemed by no means in a hurry to disclose the nature of her aspirations and a silence ensued during which she sat with downcast lashes and reticent lips while honora stared gloomily at the portrait lucilla's heart to tell the truth was beating rather rapidly whenever the thought of the subject of that portrait entered her mind she was arrested somewhere in her universe a great note sounded above the portrait was a second object the sight of which conveyed a shock to honora this was a crucifix it was not of very handsome or expensive material and had probably been cheaply purchased in some foreign town but it was realistic and had the artistic beauty which was first thrown into the subject by early devoutness and which has lingered in the majesty of association above it on a scroll were the words ecce homo beneath it an inscription this have i done for thee what hast thou done for me in addition to the sacredness of the common association the figure was fraught to honora's mind with a particular burden of memory the outstretched arms and drooping head thus elevated in the corner of the girl's bare room affected her as a visible protest a silent command intensified by reproach stealthily into the little chamber seemed to creep the familiar fragrance of her father's saint-like nature a keen reminder of humble sacrifice how was it that the rejected and scorned idea that exploded notion of bygone generations had met her here again in these new surroundings and in close proximity to this modern-minded girl honora's gloomy stare changed gradually into a distinct frown and then her eyes slid from the crucifix and fastened on the portrait below while looking at one face the eye of her mind saw another she too possessed a portrait and at this moment she had visions of the picture of leslie littleton lying face downwards in the drawer of her bureau at home and locked up in disgrace then since no answer to her question appeared to be forthcoming and since this recollection of leslie was exceedingly dispiriting she rose to shake off the impression and walked up to the picture and looked at it she found the face remarkable she thought it must be the head of a notable of some kind the picture was almost in profile the lines of the head were very free and generous there was a fine intellectuality in the brow the nose was strong and dogged and the lower part of the face gave a particular impression of force while the eyes and brows threw out an unexpected suggestion of sensitiveness and idealism it was the head of a resolute fighter virile powerful yet the whole effect was of a deep humanness and the general expression quiet and kindly taken altogether the head in its rough strength its agile and vigorous pose its living modernity was an extraordinary contrast in significance to the fainting figure above it lucilla intensely conscious of her movements remained on the sofa she felt like a child playing the game of now it burns now it is cold and having every consciousness of where the secret lies hidden who is this asked honora that returned lucilla rising and walking after her just to gain time she knew not for what that is the portrait of one of the leaders of modern thought she spoke as though the fact were known to fame honora who habitually disliked to acknowledge ignorance did not do so now 
she turned away and still uneasily conscious of her own particular portrait at home fallen like dagon in the house of the gods began to draw on her gloves i wish she began well what asked lucilla that we could do without men altogether the last word was emphatic and she was busy now with the whole fourteen buttons it would be an immense simplification of life if that is desirable returned lucilla the old fathers said something of the kind concerning that fair evil woman cowards said honora they made her the scapegoat of their own vileness honora naturally felt bitter against the fathers possibly we need not precipitate ourselves into the same error i prefer to think out the problem fairly but the mention of the fathers had drawn honora's attention again to the crucifix half fearful of giving offence or of showing indelicate curiosity she pointed to it timidly i am surprised to see that here said she slowly lucilla looked at it reverently it is the idea which of all others i desire to keep present with me said she quietly behold the man yes said honora with increasing interest the figure stands for humanity in its majesty and suffering it stands to me for all that accumulated experience so hardly won to which i was born the fortunate heir but to which when i was so born i had added nothing i am afraid i do not understand it sounds rather mystical to me honora tooted her tongue not to speak coldly she was too sincerely desirous to win lucilla's friendship and to atone for her own mistakes to permit the rise of antagonism now do you not i am one of those who count myself in the foremost ranks of time that is very beautiful but behind me through the long ages what agony and struggle to acquire the accumulated knowledge and power which makes life full of lovely and dignified possibilities history is a very living page to me can i accept the inheritance so won for me lightly she passed her finger with a kind of solemn tenderness over the embossed words this i have done for thee what hast thou done for me and if she continued gently such agony and struggle lie behind what agony and struggle are with us still go down any street of the less fashionable resorts of london and see if you find no reflection from that broken form in the foremost ranks of time it is because of the immensity of the inheritance we have received that the measure of our responsibility and of the claim laid upon us is so great honora closed her eyes giddily she was perfectly silent for several moments in the foremost ranks of time that was her favourite conception of herself but what a distance between her reading of the position and lucilla's i wish i knew where you get your thoughts your way of looking at things said she when she was able to speak lucilla did not answer for a moment some come to it of themselves said she softly and evasively but honora noticed that involuntarily she had stretched out her fine little finger again was passing it slowly thoughtfully round the rim of the portrait i have felt myself at fault about things lately said honora humbly lucilla surveyed the handsome face softened to unusual beauty by this mood she changed her tone to a half caressing gaiety it would be pleasant wouldn't it if we had a sort of bradshaw's guide to life said she coming a little nearer i am afraid there isn't such a thing but will you come with me one evening where you can hear some new things for yourself of course i will come said honora and she stooped to kiss lucilla's cheek End of chapter six chapter seven of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. transition by emma francis brook chapter seven that conversation with lucilla dennison was a turning point in honora's career it marked for one thing the beginning of a conspicuous success in her work as an educationalist 
next morning when she waked and remembered lucilla's new bearing towards her a pleasant and comforting ray mingled with her thoughts so accustomed had she become to gloom and coldness that the idea of even one friend's support almost sufficed to recall the old radiant sense of happiness having made up her mind to step out of her self-imposed imprisonment honora was quite inclined to find as much enjoyment as she could in a sunny serviceableness her ideas were already busy with reforms to reorganize and plan was a natural exercise of her powers even now as she put up the thick plaits of her hair with quick white fingers she was mentally plunging her eager organizing faculty into affairs and shaping her first step the late conversation with lucilla gave a special tincture to her ideas nor was she uninfluenced by margaret henderson's taunt about routine the initial step said she to herself as she clasped her belt about her comely waist is to call the teachers into my private room and to find out what each has got at the back of her mind there lies my reserve army my power of course there was not a touch of the niggard about honora's nature and when she had made up her mind to a thing she performed it generously and without any underhand shame in her change but amongst the under mistresses was a subdued tumult when they received honora's first shy invitation to tea and to a school conference in her room no one knew how to take it but it was discovered that lucilla was on the headmistress's side when the great occasion came round lucilla who was of course in honora's confidence was deputed by her as first mistress to open the little meeting margaret henderson was gently but firmly placed in a position of honour as chairman honora herself with burning cheeks and a light of soft excitement in her eyes took a position by the side of the table a group of half a dozen under teachers shy curious and expectant sat opposite lucilla stood up behind the table and the candles and leaned her head a little forward towards the audience and began to speak first shyly then eagerly every one was conscious that the occasion was a great one and no one was surprised when lucilla informed them that changes were contemplated in the school and that these would take the shape of certain educational innovations in their educational undertaking it was obvious she said that a sort of holocaust had first to be offered up in the shape of routine work to received ideas to parents to the committee and the necessary drudgery of learning as far as this routine work went the school was undoubtedly doing admirably but a certain lack had been felt indeed some uneasiness had tormented the consciences of the teachers because they suspected that their best strength was not being put forth the truth was that it was just where the routine work left off that the great opportunity began because here was the occasion for the use of the fruitful gift of individual originality in tuition yet here it was that they had found the great lack the routine work of course trained the bodies and furnished the minds of the children no doubt they might say that over and above was a constant interfusing with the routine of the collected influence of the teaching idea the something whole which is always greater than the mere sum of the parts and this was excellent and not to be lost sight of but when the best was said there had been no direct instruction in the application of training to life itself in lucilla's opinion the thing conspicuously left out by routine was the exercise of the children's judgment and thought upon things directly touching 
life and conduct honora speaking immediately after lucilla said she was in thorough agreement with her first mistress and in order to make a preliminary suggestion she was about to propose a progressive series of weekly lessons to be given to every class in the school on the lines of that heimatskunde which miss dennison had learnt about during a term spent in a german girls school these classes were to be organized by the teachers in common and opportunity given to each teacher in turn to handle the subject from her own particular point of view the classes were to be called the english citizen and the object of them would be by simple instruction in facts in facts collected from all sides of a question to draw out of the children's own minds a fair estimate of the reality of their own position in regard to the society in which they lived and the material for judgment on what constitutes just personal conduct here an eager teacher with a face like a bright-eyed bird asked what kind of subjects would be treated in the classes why said honora we must take care to make them simple we have to draw out the children's own powers of making a right judgment and we must be careful not to impose any theories of our own we must deal only with subjects suitable to their undeveloped lives and mental power yes said lucilla we don't want to tell them what we think but to put them into a position to think for themselves when they are old enough for real problems to touch them i thought said honora for instance that caste or class feeling would be a very good subject in a school full of girls you would i suppose said the bird-faced teacher standing up in her excitement show them the relations of all classes to the common and general life i should show them the relation of different parts to the whole life of a nation said margaret henderson all that would come in under the head of citizen said honora it would train them said a thoughtful-looking girl into a habit of deference to others it would give them the predisposition towards it yes indeed cried lucilla when i think of the mark of supercilious contempt stamped on the faces of boys and girls who have nothing but their father's incomes to recommend them i said remarked honora that each ought to treat every subject from her own special point of view i shall expect our mathematician and our logician to do great things in their own lines then of course we ought to have a scheme of subjects and there are plenty of other projects to be thought of a rustle of excitement ran through the group each girl turned out to be eager with an idea of her own that evening was the beginning of a great uplift in the school of a genuine revival it became necessary to arrange evenings for the sketching out and comparison of work so much it seemed had been missed out of the education of the children these evenings were always held in honora's room and were occasions for cakes and tea-drinking and laughter as well a glow of energy expanded the nature it was indeed astounding to honora to find how suddenly the dead and heavy surroundings had started into life every morning she sprang up to fresh interest and at the end of a fortnight was rapidly taking her place as one of the most active and resourceful headmistresses in london she had always been a very natural woman underneath her superiority frankly she loved power and when once she had discovered the sweetness of exercising it legitimately she entered into the change with zest she was utterly without the ascetic or self-sacrificing spirit the new departure which was so great a boon to the school was pure enjoyment to her she found it a pleasant direction of activity to useful ends there was no strain or self-torment in the matter at all 
one thing surprised her and that was to find how many educational ideas leapt into her brain once she had set it to the work this fact lent the delightful sense of adequacy to the problem before her isn't it amazing said she to lucilla in one of the delicious unbent moments to think that just a set of girls as we in effect are should have such a splendid work entrusted to us i had no idea that i should find so much in it such a world of interest such scope she laughed a little at herself as she used the familiar word all sorts of things seemed to be breaking down in my own nature i mean and new life flowing everywhere yes said lucilla it is so she was in honora's room they were writing but the occasion was really one of leisure you see added lucilla absently and slowly dipping her pen in the ink that is our method to put what we think into everything we have to do the duty that lies nearest to us transformed that is all not to go fussing round it makes us very strong honora stared at her she was impressed by the idea that lucilla was quoting talking from memory lucilla what are you referring to who are we what do you mean she asked lucilla blushed and opened her eyes is there anything at the back of it didn't you find it all out for yourself did somebody tell it you honora's questions fell thick lucilla still blushing had a smile on her lips it is she answered evasively a secret that several people hold honora looked at her a moment in silence then she remembered the portrait hanging on her friend's wall that no doubt would prove a clue to much in lucilla's history and point of view she was persuaded that lucilla's firm little hand was somehow greatly in touch with the exterior world the portrait probably had to do with the matter in short she threw down her own pen pushed aside all her papers and assumed a most natural demeanour lucilla said she coaxingly her mouth with the short upper lip and pretty fullness looking extraordinarily bewitching i really cannot endure a secret that is when i'm not in it myself do tell me fudge did i say there was a secret a headmistress ought to be above such things said lucilla engrossing herself with her papers but i'm not at least not when school hours are over just now i'm nothing but a girl this said lucilla writing away with a subtle smile on her face is a most extraordinary lapse i thought you were sixth classic or something elevated of that kind no said honora stretching herself her arms above her head her feet well out from her chair somehow i'm not sixth classic any more i'm just honora kemble a tot twenty four and i want to put away our books and to run round the schoolroom or skip lucilla will you have a game of battledore and shuttlecock with me in the gymnasium and afterwards tell me the secret honora suddenly threw herself over the table and brought her face glowing and red and coaxing near her friends i'll have a game of battledore but i won't tell the secret said lucilla i'll order coffee and queen cakes then you will tell not i lucilla jumped up and began to dance about the room she was a tiny thing honora was considerably larger she took an unfair advantage springing from her chair she darted on her companion caught her in her arms and held her tight now tell said she it was extraordinary what might happen in the headmistress's room now it was no longer sealed to the superior person oh have mercy cried lucilla i was always a bit of a thing i shall break if you squeeze too tight lucilla said honora solemnly i now remember that you promised to tell you did when i came to your room a promise is a promise sometimes it's pie crust no it isn't my bond my bond i'll have my bond loose me said lucilla perhaps 
well now said she when she was free i will explain that it is too late for this term i had not forgotten my promise does one ever forget one's rash moments but your new school plans have taken up the whole of our time at the beginning of next term in the early autumn you shall know with that in spite of her superior physical strength honora was perforce obliged to be content End of chapter seven chapter eight of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma francis brooke chapter eight early next autumn when the term had recommenced lucilla informed honora that an opportunity had occurred and that she could if she liked accompany her that evening well where are we going oh you will see why be impatient to anticipate events when honora found herself seated by lucilla's side in a large hall that was at present three parts empty but was rapidly filling with people she felt just a little excited it was the first relief from school routine that she had allowed herself since her arrival in london besides lucilla had vouchsafed absolutely no information as to the nature of the entertainment she looked round about her with interest not a very distinguished set said she but there are some remarkably good faces in spite of the change in her attitude towards the school work and the loosing of her faculties from rigidity to sunny activity under lucilla's influence honora was still honora lucilla had drawn out the best part of her nature she had not altered it honora's main position remained the same nor was her opinion about the event that had driven her from home changed her intercourse with her father was limited to regular letters tender upon his side gently respectful upon hers looking round now upon the audience that was fast collecting in the hall she seemed to discover a certain common quality in the faces with exceptions of course she seemed to distinguish the trace of an intellectual or at least strenuous life and a particular absence of ennui many looked tired none looked bored there were also evidences of something specially intimate and binding in their acquaintanceship one with another it was almost possible to pick out the mere curiosity seekers from the gathering for the rest the assemblage was difficult to classify absolutely there was even an infusion of fashion and philistinism side by side with the workman's jacket honora quite in the old style contented herself with remarking that they were not in the least like her set so far the platform which had been empty when they entered had not attracted her attention she was recalled from her wandering glances by hearing a man's voice declaring the meeting to be open and requesting the lecturer to read his paper the tones were unmistakable honora jumped as though she had been shot and her eyes wide open and almost terrified anxiously sought the platform the voice that had shocked her was leslie littleton's she found him standing upon the raised dais exactly opposite occupying the position of chairman of the meeting their glances met and a look of comical amazement shot into his face honora hot vexed and almost faint with horror shrank back in her chair both she and leslie had been willingly or unwillingly thinking each of the other since their interview in the rectory garden and for a few seconds there was a furious throbbing of pulses on either side at the unexpected encounter who is in the chair demanded she unreasonably and passionately of lucilla 
leslie littleton was the reply leslie littleton repeated honora do you know him i do where are we what is the meeting is it religious a ghastly doubt made for the moment the image of leslie real in her sight upon the platform lucilla slightly laughed we are in a socialist hall and this is a socialist gathering and a socialist lecture is about to be given some people affirm that socialism is religion honora bit her lip she could hardly say that the information relieved her though indeed the figure of her friend on the platform stood firmer to her gaze the lecture began but honora for a few moments neither saw nor heard anything the word socialism represented to her mind an obscure kind of ruffianism she glanced again at the audience and now read violent revolution and street rioting in the faces whose type had struck her as remarkable returning to the platform she found leslie sitting with his arms over the table his fingers tearing a little bit of paper to pieces and his head slightly bent ashamed of himself of course said she with a scorn which was a pure bit of deliberate self-mystification in the agitation of her discovery honora missed the opening portion of the lecture but not more than that for her attention was presently caught and then riveted she raised her eyes and looked at the speaker he was a man of something over thirty of small build and of no superfluous flesh and with a fine rugged head honora remarked the evidences of culture in voice manner and diction she was sensitive to these things she caught also the familiar air of the student this she thought is the kind of man who makes himself sure of his ground but there was something over and above that something which was absolutely new to her not only had the lecturer an unusual mastery over words a clearness and simplicity of thought and a fearlessness of expression that drove the sentences out in well-directed blows but in the matter of his lecture he himself had an indomitable faith deft and ingenious in the logical application of argument he might be but the main quality was burning conviction and absolute sincerity to a girl accustomed to the superior didactic manner the scholarly hesitation and careful non-self-committal of a cambridge lecturer this fire of sincerity was something astounding the kind of mental integrity which is called conviction is rare it is something very different from learned acquirement honora had never come across it before she was obliged to listen whether she wished it or not moreover there was humour and racy originality in the turn of some of the lecturer's phrases pointing to a very deep streak of the quality that should be common to all men but which has been almost lost to the race in the processes of civilization and that is of humanness with this honora was somewhat at cross purposes and the humour brought a frown to her brow however she was now listening with all her ears by and by she felt herself turning hot and giddy she had never heard a socialist lecture before and she was instantly struck by the coincidence in thought between her father and this determined leader of the disorderly advanced radically their position was the same the recognition of the fact threw her into a tumult of angry agitation how could her father have come into contact with these strongly flavoured ideas the blood flamed into her cheeks and her indignant eyes sought first leslie who did not look up and then lucilla it is a plot she thought in her wrath it must be a plot between them to make me come and listen to this ill-bred nonsense for honora impressed though she was by the man's power and sincerity remained intellectually quite undisturbed her temper not her mind was moved 
she marvelled that the audience could sit still under the unmitigated sentences it was a point of added vexation that honestly she could not treat this man of pronounced views with intellectual scorn his knowledge of history and economics was as profound as his logic was merciless this was no empty declaimer honora knew a trained mind when she met one just now he was touching upon the attitude of the church towards democracy a slight smile playing over his features and responded to by a rustle of applause from the audience presaged one of those sallies that made honora more furious than anything else even the bishops believe and tremble said he before entering on a smashing indictment of the timidity and hedging of the church in face of popular movements grossly impertinent muttered honora driven by her hatred of democracy to champion the cause of a church she had lightly laughed to scorn in former days who is the lecturer she whispered to lucilla his name is paul sheridan and who is paul sheridan a leader of modern thought of course the same head whose likeness hung on the walls of lucilla's sitting-room she looked at him with renewed interest the upshot of the contemplation was vexation on her part at her own inability to catalogue him he belonged to no category with which she was familiar during the rest of the lecture she sat with thumping heart and her hands clenched into two kid-gloved but very real fists she disdained to lift her eyes and to meet leslie's but kept paling under his imagined gaze the lecture being concluded a debate began this was a rather extraordinary commingling of astute cleverness on the part of a few with the usual randomness of suggestion on the part of the many there was considerable heat and fire on all sides and what was wanting in reasonableness was made up for by energy occasionally an evident sense of personal injury carried speakers away and disorder occurred on which occasions leslie found it necessary as chairman to ring a little bell honora was forced again to admire the lecturer he was equal to the management of a rather obstreperous crowd his repartee being swift and clever and always winning to the heart while his more serious replies were clear and ready and his patience kindly on the whole he was more admirable in reply even than in the lecture if she could but have despised him once she glanced at lucilla rather to her surprise lucilla's head was downcast and the features sad and pale honora had rather expected to find her looking exhilarated the debate being over people began to disperse and honora rose with the rest the platform was already vacated and the natural and proper course was surely for mr littleton to present himself no one appeared however save mr sheridan who came forward to greet lucilla and the latter took the opportunity of introducing him to that one of his audience who was least delighted with his oratory upon coming down from the platform mr sheridan's manner had completely lost the joyous militancy which had characterized it his bearing was now very quiet modest and retiring shyness as an accompaniment of ability and force of character has a charm it rather set off than obliterated the strong lines of his head and jaw for a moment however it misled honora perhaps the man was not quite what he had looked up there on the dais there was something almost appealing in his eyes encouraged by this hint of trepidation she ventured a remark that struck her as final if everything were equally divided to-day to-morrow there would be rich and poor again said she with her condescending air the grave timidity of the eyes looking into her own changed instantly to amusement it would be rather difficult to divide some things equally wouldn't it main drains for instance said he 
honora started she blushed things of that kind have to belong to everybody she snapped well try and extend the communal quality of main drains to all things in the excited state of her feeling this was more than she could bear and traces of her discontent appeared in her manner mr sheridan instantly withdrew from the interview apologising as he did so for any offence he might inadvertently have given by a stiff but courteous bow and a smile of such inimitable sweetness that it made matters worse by placing her hopelessly in the wrong ruffian was the illogical comment with which she relieved her anger honora drawn up to her full height now glanced impatiently over the crowd littleton she discovered with his broad back turned to her and his shoulders inclined towards a stout round woman who was discoursing with volubility honora rather gratuitously assumed that leslie's preoccupation was feigned let us go said she to lucilla it is suffocatingly hot in the dark tumult of the streets her heat cooled down to depression she followed lucilla along the crowded pavement to a corner where omnibuses continually drew up to carry away the knots of passengers who as continually renewed themselves here the two girls stood silently side by side waiting with the rest the roar of the city about them lucilla was still pale downcast and silent but an incident occurred which seemed to startle her at once into a markedly changed condition for in spite of her force of character she was built on the usual lines of a woman with a swifter responsiveness to influences than the other sex and with nervous centres more easily perturbed miss dennison honora turning round saw a man raising his hat and holding out his hand to lucilla his face with the street light flaring in it was plainly to be seen it was dark and foreign he was a tall man slenderly even elegantly built the countenance was gentle and cultivated and it was beautified now by a peculiarly luminous smile honora might have found it attractive but she habitually hated foreigners and indeed preferred all her acquaintances of the male sex to be built upon rather conventional lines so that as she expressed it you might know where you had them ah monsieur d'auvernay is it you lucilla rather timidly extended her hand even honora thought reluctantly at the same time there were evidences in her face of subdued excitement you are out alone can i not help you may i not escort you it was excellent english and spoken with only the slightest accent thank you i have a friend with me and the bus will be here directly you have been the stranger with an expressive gesture indicated the street out of which they had just come yes paul sheridan has been speaking the stranger shrugged his shoulders drew himself up with a swift natural movement and shook back his handsome head for he was handsome honora saw it now unusually handsome and he looked particularly so at the moment with a kind of inspired disdain animating his features i wish that you understood us mr sheridan better he and you are working to the same end it is only the method that differs the frenchman smiled a row of even teeth glittered under his moustache i trust you miss dennison the stress on the pronoun excluded mr sheridan honora was surprised to see that lucilla dropped back to the pale depressed manner i wish i could induce you to visit our place he continued oh well perhaps i shall one day the tone was hurried and nervous but i have very little time honora here is our bus the stranger disappeared and from the confusion of traffic lucilla selected the right vehicle by a fortunate chance as it appeared to her less experienced companion and the two girls got in and sat down silently side by side that frenchman does not seem to have a good opinion of mr sheridan 
but dear me lucilla said honora tartly i never saw a man who is less likely to be affected by other people's opinion than to-night's lecturer lucilla making no reply honora turned her face to the window to watch the street figures and the little bits of woeful drama that flashed to her in the partial light here a solitary form near the brilliant window of a gin palace fighting a losing battle in the grip of vice there a whispering pair whose shoulders were shaped to so much degradation in their common secret that the eyes shrank involuntarily away here an organ grinder handling music for a drunken girl who danced in a horrible isolation while the indifferent crowd passed on there a poverty-stricken woman counting coppers in her palm while her blear-eyed child stared at the gaslight shining in her fevered haggard face other figures there were of happier and more innocent suggestion but all as it seemed to honora tracked in that dreadful city by the silent foot of inevitable disaster suddenly she laid her hand on lucilla's two men were threading their way amongst the foot passengers side by side the broader of the two forms was littleton's and the slighter was sheridan's the girls watched them until they were lost in the crowd and then honora leaned back and closed her eyes i'm sure i don't know whose ears i want to box whether my own leslie's or the lecturer's thought she End of chapter eight chapter nine of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma frances brooke chapter nine that was a handsome woman with lucilla dennison said sheridan to his companion as the vehicle rolled past them she is an old friend of my own returned littleton indeed i did not see you speak to her i was uncertain as to my reception said littleton is that so the tone was rather rallying not that not what you think returned littleton too emphatically to be reassuring but it is a unique story come into my rooms and hear it they turned from the main road and threaded some dull by-streets into a square with dusty trees and patches of green impounded like a strayed piece of country between bars of iron the near branches sparkled in the gaslight and in the darkness beyond some unforgotten remnant of natural melody was shaken out by these poor harpers from the forest leaving the square they came into a more frequented street where were a block of chambers before one of the outer doors littleton paused and this being opened the two mounted the stairs together to the fourth story here they exchanged the dim light for a bright well-furnished room and here by the fire lit even so early in the season sheridan sat down to hear littleton's story of the rector and his daughter he told it well with sympathy even with emotion what will he do with the tithe said sheridan sharply when he had finished not let it go back into the landlord's pockets i hope no he is a churchman through and through and considers church property sacred particularly the tithe i believe he will no more surrender it than he will use it for himself then what is the upshot he collects it as usual but every farthing goes for church or church schools or charitable purposes that's better how did his bishop take it i wonder oh his bishop sneered condescendingly he professed to fear lest the action might seem a movement of self-exaltation at the expense of the general church body the rector's reply was however given in such a spirit of sweetness and retiredness from self that in the end the bishop let mr kemble take his own way 
you see the rector is deeply respected by the dignitaries of the church and he could hardly be snubbed too severely for a desire to follow christ literally if the example caught on it would be awkward for some of our church magnates i suspect but now look here can't we work something out of this littleton's eyes laughed as he quietly fingered his beard mr kemble did not come at his ideas through our movement said he i know that but it helps to show that our movement has come out of everything else you are perfectly scandalous sheridan you think of nothing but seizing the opportunity sheridan smiled what else is there to seize said he littleton laughed again i grant our movement has come out of everything else the wind bloweth as it listeth that is so but there is nothing against our putting up a windmill or two to catch it sheridan you are shamelessly prosaic we are told that socialism is a dream let it be a dream then when i get a good dream i'm not satisfied until i've done something to cage it littleton turned and silently regarded his friend with amused affectionate eyes sheridan unconscious of his look was staring rather gravely into the fire the light played over his face which was always eminently expressive leslie had found in the man something unique he had strongly attached himself to him in a selective and enduring friendship one founded upon a profound compatibility at the bottom of two natures otherwise apparently dissimilar paul sheridan's history was of the kind which in the case of an ordinary man might have sunk him into a complete rut of the commonplace his birthplace was london a fact in itself indicative of an absence of romantic or striking background moreover he came of a family occupying a respectable but narrow position in the lower middle class he was born into a world which presented from the beginning a prosaic aspect there was no glitter or colour of any sort in the opening years of his life from any false idea in his estimate of his own position in the environment in which he found himself he was debarred the brilliant the unusual the picturesque were wanting the basis of things for him was prose again he was familiarized early with the idea that the means for his existence with all that such an existence might come to imply to himself were to be won by his own application and effort that is a lonely thought but it is one which has a fine effectiveness and no child of the nation should be debarred from acquiring it something of course paul owed to ancestry he came of good wholesome material and brought into the world with him unusual mental powers that he possessed a very deep imagination of a particularly masculine type no one probably suspected yet it was this hidden imaginativeness this wide-sided discriminating power of mental vision which differentiated him from his fellow-men and gave him that unique quality which was destined to bear fruit in his life both for himself and for others a great characteristic such as this bears others in its train and many unusual attributes both of heart and brain clustered round this one of his hidden imagination meanwhile the utmost thing was his prose although paul by his position missed the educational advantages common to a lad of the upper classes he had his opportunities and his early training led him to embrace them eagerly what education he could lay hold of he took from a child his mind ran into the business of acquiring knowledge and information and very early gave indications of its special tastes for from the age of thirteen onwards he found pleasure in collecting statistics and pasting or entering them into a book a fact was his delight he liked to know the bearings of a thing its present limits and powers of growth 
he liked to test and examine and he would watch from year to year how a thing developed and would measure it in figures all parts of life attracted him the manoeuvres of an army excited pleasurable mental feelings and he would copy a battlefield out of a newspaper with tin soldiers and chessmen on a table and perform the scientific part of the warfare over again in mimic evolutions with his toys science too he loved because it showed him how things were done and how they had come about but as he became older his particular intellectual quality showed itself in a passion for economics and history he had passed every examination and competed for and won whatever prizes were open to general competition and had earned enough money to go abroad and study for a time in germany before he was twenty-one but it was after that age that he began to make a mark as a student of and writer on economics meanwhile the business of earning his own living was always before him he went into the dull daily duties of routine work with the same effectiveness and energy that he put into his self-chosen occupations if any one remarked upon his equal devotion to small things as to great he looked surprised how am i to know that the small things may not turn out to be great he would reply with this passion for detail and strenuous habit of living straight into the moment it was to be expected that by the age of twenty-two sheridan should find himself in a good position he became confidential clerk in a first-rate business house with a rising salary and the prospect of a pension or partnership in the end just at this point however calamity overtook him it is possible that had it not been so sheridan might have fallen into mere successful routine and never have found the greater self which lay enshrined within that hidden and little suspected imaginative power and yet the imaginative power was always there and where there is gold life mines and probes until it is brought to the surface she struck her pick now where he was most sensitive he found himself under a charge of gross neglect amounting to dishonesty sheridan had no means of disproving his guilt or in the least accounting for what had occurred the real delinquent a clever scamp had so managed matters that the charge could neither be proved nor disproved against sheridan he was subjected to all the humiliation of an examination by his chiefs without coming off in it triumphantly having regard to his immense services he was not discharged indeed he was grudgingly acquitted but the eyes with which he was regarded became cold and changed the event shook sheridan in every part of his nature it was agony to his sensitiveness a quality which underlay his masculine strength in unusual power as it is sure to do in any highly gifted and well-developed creature he saw himself rejected condemned and misjudged in those very qualities which he was conscious were of particular worth to the persons on whose behalf he had exercised them sheridan was an intensely proud man proud in that silent strong unostentatious way which is better than humility a vain man would have resorted to pettish resignation of his post as a protest against the indignity of suspicion sheridan did nothing of the kind he argued to himself that such a step would be to surrender a part of his own position what had happened was due not to anything wrong in himself but to the stupidity of his chiefs who mistrusted the quality of a man who had served them he hated in a quite human unsaint-like manner the fellow-clerk who had laid the trap for him and despised from the bottom of his clever mind the idiocy of the employers who fell into it and misjudged him but that's not my concern said he if they are fools there is no need why i should be one too if this had not happened i should have gone on in this particular path and i am not going to be pushed out of it now 
so he went on day by day just as if it had not happened so far went his will but to his sensitiveness it remained agony and under the hand of this suffering his imagination awoke and lifted him up this was a time of an all-devouring energy of work to sheridan he wrote lectured studied and he examined every possible phase of life that came before him and suddenly through the eyes of his own suffering he saw clearly imaginatively potently the suffering of his fellow-men it rolled up before him in an intensely vivid presentment that shook him to the heart and with a man too wholesomely occupied to be tempted to dwell on the emotional side of life this disturbance of the nature was genuine and profound and the precursor of lasting results he was not moved now to forget upon the morrow the experience cut deep into his heart and formed the starting point of a new departure out of the present emotional moment was born the idea which he was hereafter destined to follow with increasing zest and persistence the idea had two sides he saw himself in the first place as the avowed servant of humanity and he saw humanity in the second place as something capable of being effectively served humanity those broken disorganized degraded shreds of it which flitted across his path every day of his life and which he viewed now with the new eyes of his own suffering was pursued to his inner vision perpetually by the hopeful figure of redemption present to his view in the warped type was the might have been and close upon that smote into his mind the determined it shall be the poetry of sheridan's nature had been born in pain but it was of a high quality and bore no trace of emotional weakness he first accepted with firm compliance his own particular burden of bitterness and then threw it aside with the brief decision of one who perceived that the casual smart hardly signified in comparison with the daily breathing tragedy of broken wasted life ever present to his knowledge the simplicity of the issue to all this unusual emotion was characteristic of the man he merely registered a vow never to refuse any public duty great or small that might come in his way few have insight enough to perceive how far-reaching and strong is such a determination towards the singleness of duty it was a clue to a quiet persistence in his methods that was in after days to prove somewhat provoking to less balanced minds and was even to be the occasion of misunderstanding and false estimation something however from the outside world was destined to be added to sheridan's experience in this moment he came into contact with the socialistic idea then crude obscure and hardly to be calculated upon in the sum of agencies for half a century the stream of socialism had run underground it was just reissuing into the light of day sheridan met with some of its adherents studied it in the works of karl marx proudhon and other lesser but more modern exponents his quick mind leapt to the idea overhauled it appropriated and changed it it is not too much to say that sheridan's conversion brought about a new era in the history of socialism a fresh phase of it which lasting or not lasting in its particular form was fitted to the needs of the age which had brought it forth and was destined to be powerfully effective and influential within it meanwhile sheridan had dreed his weird by imperceptible degrees and by sheer persistence in duty he had regained his position in the estimation of his chiefs finally a complete answer to the charge laid against him was suddenly brought to light whereupon an ample apology 
promotion and compensation were offered him sheridan however had lately felt that his occupation in a house of business even one that paid trade union rates of wages to all its employés was too cramping for him it limited his opportunities hampered and curtailed his spirit he needed and sought a wider world in which to exercise his powers and freer occasions in which to pursue the now leading idea of his life he resigned his position therefore and entered into the precarious but much more influential life of a journalist such had been his existence for a couple of years before he met with littleton at the time of his encounter with his future friend he was a well-known writer not only in the newspapers but also in the leading reviews the peculiar turn of his political ideas rendering him invaluable to any editor anxious for the admixture of originality and glowing conviction amid the learned stately and less aggressive articles that make up the ordinary material the advent of littleton into sheridan's life was quickly followed by another pleasant event after a lecture on socialism at a public hall in london a young girl advanced from the audience towards him and holding out her hand with a mixture of timidity and fearless innocence in her bearing informed mr sheridan who had accepted the small fingers tendered to him in shy gravity that she wished to throw in her lot with him and his friends because she believed that every word he had said was true sheridan was touched pleased and embarrassed by the incident women moved a little outside his plane and he was troubled by a feeling of the strange and unaccustomed in dealing with them the girl who seemed extraordinarily young stood her ground with a patience and persistence that at least argued sincerity i am older than i look i intend if you will have me to be one of you said she quickly when she remarked his hesitation the girl was lucilla dennison and the incident which had taken place some two or three years ago marked her entrance upon the life of a socialist lucilla brought to the cause qualities of her own the movements of her mind were large single clear she was clever sheridan was apt to be a little impatient with mediocrity this being a quality he could not understand and soon became a useful lieutenant of the movement being regarded by the rest of the band as sheridan's particular convert while on her side she attached herself to him as her chosen guide sheridan always regarded himself as being in some measure responsible for lucilla but indeed there was amongst the little band of comrades an easiness and simplicity of intercourse born of coincidence of aim which made the duty light the aim was the diffusion of light and the acquirement of social knowledge but the scope of the movement widened and every day opened out some fresher possibility and some new field for effort meanwhile there was in the character of lucilla a region of reticence and reserved force which sheridan felt that he did not touch occasionally he speculated upon this element of resistance in a girl so slight and enthusiastic and so yielding to his lead in most things but the speculation never went further than an interested thought or two lucilla was his very good comrade and none could more reverently leave alone than could sheridan the circle of reticence and reserve in another which he so pre-eminently respected in himself littleton's friendship was a great gain he brought with him an element of culture as a university man of culture of a special quality in which sheridan's education thorough though it was in some respects was wanting leslie's occupation in london was that of a civil servant and this fact together with certain of his characteristics kept him a little in the background at a time when sheridan was stepping more and more forward into public life 
but on the whole the two men ran abreast in a generous give-and-take friendship both aimed more and more consciously at definitely throwing their ideas into administrative form the gradual realization of socialistic notions in legislation and in municipal control being the life task which sheridan with the full concurrence of littleton and others placed before himself littleton who was still smiling at the evidences of his friend's habitual alertness after opportunity stretched his hand towards the mantel-shelf for a pipe and lights he offered a box of cigarettes to sheridan who however shook his head and declined them lucilla dennison introduced me to miss kemble after the lecture said he and i saw at once she owed me a grudge i hadn't the faintest idea why was it because of the part about the church of course conceive the effect of your admonition on the daughter of a clergyman but she does not agree with her father she ought to have been glad well it appears she wasn't did she say anything no she looked it sheridan laughed softly i'm afraid she was very much offended with me indeed however i don't pretend to be a man to make favourable impressions upon women i don't know how to do it of course i wish i did except that a perfect manner argues a wasted youth miss kemble's manner can be very pronounced at times said littleton gravely and with recollection oh very however added sheridan i believe i can pardon anything to anybody the moment i understand it i believe you can by the way did you notice how pale lucilla dennison looked to-night yes i don't know what is coming over her said sheridan frowning and pulling his moustache no one can explain it if you cannot i assure you i cannot i haven't any direct clue sometimes i think she is disappointed with the movement possibly with me there are offences of course the claim of the community upon one's service leaves little time for self-culture but she should accept this yes but i question if she sees why the idea of self-perfection has to be dropped by any one whose social consciousness is enlarged the pursuit of self-culture is a very expensive and all-absorbing affair we have not the right or the time to undertake it as a prime object while the whole race is enslaved to hard conditions our bit of work is to ease and lessen the general slavery and degradation we can only do that by taking on ourselves some of the defects of servitude we lose ourselves to find ourselves i would suggest that we have no right to occupy ourselves with ourselves at all i have no time and no heart for this self-culture and as for lucilla i've offended her ignorantly no doubt said sheridan but if she liked me once she ought to go on liking me sheridan i don't suppose for one moment she has left off liking you what is it all about then sheridan again slowly passed his hand it was a lithe and rather graceful hand over and over his moustache unless indeed is it true that she has formed an acquaintance with achille d'auverne i don't know i can hardly fancy it you see personally i detest d'auverne i'm not sure that i detest any one but i don't agree with d'auverne the man's a patent absurdity what does lucilla want to foregather with him for you and he are on a different tack altogether well i am then and i'd rather be i don't understand why he should have an attraction for lucilla but it's astounding what a fascination the red cap has for a woman they will run at the heels of any scamp who takes liberty as his view halloo that is because they haven't got hold of the right thing i can understand their running after liberty but lucilla ought to know better d'auverne is no sort of a chap d'auverne is hot for violent revolution and you are against it the former is the more picturesque lucilla isn't that sort i'm against violent revolution because it defeats its own ends of course your genius sheridan lies in your instinct after the trend of events sheridan laughed the most rigid conservative has that too only somnambulistically 
he finds himself moved on by the sheer impetus of events to the position of last century's advanced thinker i have no doubt that tom paine's idea of old age pensions will be a future conservative electioneering cry and that a conservative government will bring in the bill i had an idea a general sort of idea about these things which i believe would work up well into a lecture said littleton we shall be wanting one soon and you might as well take it what is the title will it work up into a tract sheridan you must know that this is an opera in words there are the orchestra and overture the dramatis personae and the story in the songs i'm afraid i don't see a tract in it then but fire away littleton had it appeared occupied some of his spare moments lately in contemplating the evidences of transition in the present phase of society and in curiously speculating upon the elements that went to make up this whole effect of a social environment in the uneasy condition of solution of change into something else the spirit of the age was he found characterized by movement by excessive movement as distinguished from periods of comparative stagnation and was manifested in a variety of activities which often apparently contradictory and being each one of them solvents yet conveyed onward through this period of transition some one dominant note which in his opinion was to be an essential element in the next more established phase the idea had sprung into his mind upon his meeting with so living a survival of the oxford movement in honora's father a survival which as distinguished from mere persistence had accommodated itself in his spirit to the modern call and the modern need littleton took therefore as his point of departure the oxford movement in the earlier decades of the century and coupling with it the contemporaneous appearances of chartism of carlyleism of christian socialism accepted them as manifestations of the early zeitgeist conveying a note of abnegation of the individual self rather than the realization of the social self the relater age expectans dominum was he took it the spirit of mediaeval revivalism at oxford and though carlyle's ideal differed and was wider and that of chartism and christian socialism was so again yet in all of them was a similarity for in each a stern and splendid inspiration was limited by the individualistic tendency to a dogma a tyranny a programme an attitude of personal benevolence such spirits as matthew arnold and clough he took next as forming a century influence which from particular characteristics he would name la maladie du siècle in them the dominant peculiarity was regret the mourning of great souls destined to officiate at the sacrifice of a past that was beloved and scarcely able to welcome the advent of a future whose strangeness and newness appeared cold and repugnant yet from them had passed out the lasting note of regard to prove truth as the only certain criterion a note to be taken up in splendour by the modern scientific spirit with clifford as a fine exponent and spinoza as a sort of intellectual ancestor after this came in his opinion the pagan spirit so eminently a solvent as revived in our era said he this is anything but festive it is sheer despair done into the best english by pater and swinburne side by side comes the aesthetic feeling a fastidious fuss about exquisite detail then comes the revolt in hope morris you know splendid old morris then all mine and all thine shall be ours illustrated by walter crane brotherhood and haymaking lastly we have constructive socialism enthusiasm done into dry work finally realism the crusade against shams blake ibsen zola maupassant turgenev etc etc all the eminent unrespectables and to cap all we have pseudo-realism the affectation of truth littleton threw himself back in his chair stretched out his feet to the fire and looked at his friend with a challenging smile is that all asked sheridan 
not all but all i feel inclined to mention for the present i've skipped ever so much there's not any more just now not for the present i'm rather glad of that and this is the overture yes but i ought to have put constructive socialism last i ought to have ended in the realization of the social self to which the whole leads up well it's a very handsome gala moffrey and i suppose wagner would do it into music i should like to hear the century orchestra but now get on i'm quite ready for the dramatis personae oh didn't i bring them in at the beginning not at all i tell you what littleton having listened so far i'm not going to be put off with the overture i want the songs the general stage behaviour the stage behaviour that is as it may be by no means i'm sure there's something feminine at the back of all this there's a she in it somewhere there always is i want you to trot out that interesting creature the sentry woman you can't expect me to give her up leslie drew his feet back leaned forward in his chair and placed his fingers together with a quick movement a dark flush came into his face and he began to speak with cutting bitterness she the zeitgeist makes her i suppose out of the weaker harder side of everything you get her from the wrong side of arnold conceited scornful she takes up science in a glib surface way and thinks she has the final word on her tongue's tip she plays with the pagan spirit delicately of course and without coarseness or offence she assumes the aesthete and thinks fastidiousness a sign of elevation in her pseudo-realism she affects the truth and in her affectation of it shows herself a noodle sheridan received this speech in silence but on his lips hovered a smile compounded of amusement and kindliness after the pause had lasted a few minutes he spoke in a soft and even tender tone i very shrewdly suspect that she has a fine tall figure and a handsome face with well-coloured cheeks and good eyes and eyebrows littleton i'm afraid you admire miss kemble very much indeed littleton frowned into the fire well i must be off said sheridan i meant to have gone home early to work half the night over the leaflet against leasehold enfranchisement the subject is coming on in the house directly and we ought to be beforehand with our information oh damn the leaflet it won't make any difference on the contrary it is very good business that leaflet has got to be ready for the press to-morrow begone then said littleton i'm in an ill mood to-night then i'd better be off of course no sooner however had the door closed behind him than he opened it again he came back and sat down on the corner of the table littleton said he without preliminary why not try and induce her to come again obviously there is lucilla dennison's influence to count on littleton stood on the hearth both hands in his pockets and his eyes fixed on the carpet there is a great deal in making up one's own mind added sheridan with his warm kind smile and then he got off the table nodded good-night and vanished End of chapter nine